It's over, or it's almost over. The end of academic tenure is happening faster than any of us thought possible. Tenure's not forever, you know. And most of America is celebrating. Unless you're on the inside in a tenure track job or have tenure, then you're not so happy. But everybody else seems to enjoy this. What is that supposed to mean? You bring shame upon this university, and it can cost you a hell of a lot more than your teaching job. So let's find out what's happening with academic tenure, a little history of the subject, get some perspective on how it impacts higher education and where it might be headed next. So tap the like button and let's get started. Hi, I'm James Callahan and this is The Do-Over Show. And I have to tell you, early in my career, I held a tenure track position at a small private college. Now, I went through the tenure process, enjoyed some of it, didn't like some of it, but I also learned from the inside, those who took advantage of it, my peers who said it's great, and some of the peers that everyone knew, yeah, they were just resting on their tenure. Is that a thing? Can you rest on your tenure? I know some did. So here's what's happening today. Just a few days ago, the Texas State Senate finally approved a bill that they had been working on for a long time, effectively ending tenure in Texas public institutions. New tonight, tenure for college professors could be coming to an end soon. This coming as a bill was filed by Texas Republicans that say this costly practice needs to end. They passed a bill that's a wake-up call for public higher education in America. Under Senate Bill 18, it says public colleges, quote, may not grant an employee of the institution tenure or any type of permanent employment status. This legislation would apply to those hired after January 1st, 2024, and not affect those who are already in tenure or tenure track, hired before that date. But the real, what's at the heart of this is the move that we're seeing across higher education in public and private institutions to try to pull back on the privilege or the permanency of tenure status. Now, the Texas proposal would allow state universities individually to create a tier system of seniority and recognize several year contract options, but have no guarantee of future employment without an ongoing performance review annually. You know, the way most of us have in our real jobs in the real world, where we have a performance review at least one a year, often twice a year, to figure out whether or not we're producing, how can we can improve, and what our future may look like without any guarantee of permanent employment. If it passes as it currently is constructed, public universities like UTSA and Texas State will be devastated. Matt Roy, News 4, San Antonio. So what's the big deal? Well, for those of us in higher education, we know we push political buttons all the time and we use tenure or the protective status of higher education to try to push the discussion forward, which means in states that don't like academics pushing the conversation forward or against the status quo, uh, in states like Iowa, in Indiana, in North Carolina, there have been efforts year after year to try to end tenure. Most of these state university systems and the state legislatures making this move uh, say that those with tenure tend to corrupt young minds. So you can insert your own Socrates joke here. And here's another recent bill from the General Assembly in North Carolina, ending tenure and shifting to multi-year contracts up to four years, but no more, as little as one year. And they state, they actually stipulate the reasons for dismissal for cause. Now, dismissal for cause has always been part of the tenure experience. It is, if you do something horrendous, they can kick you out. But here's what's different. The North Carolina dismissal includes incompetence, neglect of duty, serious misconduct, unsatisfactory performance, and institutional financial contingencies. That is, they can just cancel a faculty line of a tenured faculty member saying, oops, sorry, that position no longer exists in a North Carolina university. And that is the workaround that even when they can't get somebody kicked out for cause, they can just make the money go away. But what's critical about the North Carolina version is who makes the decision about retention. It's not done by a group of peers. It's not even done by a department chair. It's done by the chancellor or academic officer at the university, that is at the administrative level, not within the department, not within the teaching faculty, not by a faculty committee. That's the change that takes that control away from the faculty body 
and puts it back in the administrative offices. And then there's the question of academic freedom because the promise of tenure and those who have promoted tenure through the 20th century and 21st century have always said that reducing the strength of tenure, that permanency associated with it, is a threat to academic freedom. Because being evaluated by your contribution to the outcomes of satisfied customers, for example, students, has decreased significantly. In fact, it's getting close to more than one half of students graduating last year in 2022 said that they felt adequately prepared for the workspace, that is the jobs that they were actually going to do with the degrees and with the programs of study that they learned in higher education. Yeah. More than 50% say you didn't do a good job with us and that reflects poorly on the institution and that reflects poorly on those who have tenure at the institution. Now opponents of the Texas bill, the North Carolina proposal and defenders of tenure everywhere say things like this. Banning tenure would harm the state's recruitment of top scholars and spark fear among professors that they could be fired for teaching or researching controversial subjects. Now, let me ask, I get that second part, controversial subjects, that's always been part of the protection that tenure would give, that you get to do your own research and study and even teach or teach a certain course that you think adds significantly to the controversy or ongoing conversation that stimulates, that irritates, that causes cognitive dissonance. I get that part. It's the first part, though, that the loss of tenure might mean that we can't attract top recruits. What does that say about those who are given tenure at these universities now? The tenured faculty that are already there. It's sort of a slight to them and their prominence to talk about attracting the 1% that is looking for that exception, that golden child of an exception of a tenured professor that they would invite. And they actually use tenure, not the process, but the reward of tenure saying, you're so significant, we'll hire you here, you won't have to go through the tenure process. You'll jump to the front of the line, we'll give you tenure as part of it. And that's part of the leverage that top performing professors that attract research money and grants or are well known and highly published, highly visible, that universities to attract them so they have a brand name at the university, someone of significance, an influencer in a field, they will use that as a reward saying, you were tenure track at this institution, they're moving too slowly, we'll jump ahead in the line, we'll give you tenure without having to go through the process. The removal of tenure ends this ability for a school to just steal faculty from other universities. And it also slights the faculty that's already there. Now, some perspective on tenure might help us here, not just the history of it, but how it developed. And that is tenure historically um, reflects how faculty were sponsored, often by trustees or benefactors. That is, trustees raise money to provide for faculty hiring and faculty permanence. That is, it, it wasn't through student fees, but it was through the activity of trustees, basically functioning as benefactors. That's the immediate background, which also meant that if you had a trustee that was on your side, you retained your position. But if you didn't, if you ran afoul of that trustee or that benefactor, they could cut off funding and you would be gone. So to instill some permanence, some retention within that, as well as protect academic freedom, the concept of permanence was added to higher education in the late 19th, early 20th century in North America. And historically, the only reason people really got bounced from this implied permanence of positions is if they violated a religious tenant of a university or a school that had a religious background. And most historic universities had a religious background. There is the 1894 case of Richard Eli, a University of Wisconsin professor who supported labor strikes to gain labor law reform. Uh, the Wisconsin legislature didn't like it, and so they asked the trustees to dismiss this professor but the trustees rejected and they affirmed a concept of tenure. And here's what they said. In all lines of academic investigation, it is of the utmost importance that the investigator should be absolutely free to follow the indications of truth wherever they may lead. Whatever may be the limitations which Trammell inquiry elsewhere, we believe the great state University of Wisconsin should, be, should ever encourage that continued and fearless sifting and winnowing by which alone the truth can be found. The hint here behind all of their rhetoric is that higher education is a forum for contested ideas that need to be heard, examined, and protected. But it was the Rollins dismissal of a professor, John Andrew Rice, a self-avowed atheist, along with three others, 
that really defined what we know as tenure today. The college's president demanded, quote, that all professors take a loyalty pledge. Now, the AAUP, if you know, you know, the American Association of University Professors got involved. Most of us would assume that the AAUP won the day and Rice and others were restored with their benefits and their back pay and the college's president was dismissed for asking for a loyalty pledge, right? Wrong. They were dismissed. They were gone. Another faculty member funded a start of a new college for these four and they just went off on their own and started a college in another state. A few years earlier, the AAUP tried to make explicit what seemed obvious in higher education and they started to popularize the notion that presumptive permanence, that's the phrase, presumptive permanence, uh, was an implicit tenant of higher education's uniqueness. A 1915 AAUP pamphlet argued that trustees should pay professors more but not bind their conscience with restrictions tied to the increase in pay and the only that peers could evaluate the faculty, that new faculty appointments were made by other faculty, and the chairpersons that included contracts, presumptive permanence or tenure, and also had to state clear grounds for termination. So basically it became a matter of contract law. And the tide though has turned to trying to fire unwanted professors though, because okay, if you can't demonstrate an obvious moral failure, then how do you get rid of tenured professors if they're protected with this contract law status? And the answer is easy. You just eliminate the position. The trustees just withdraw funding for that position. And conveniently, the professor that they couldn't fire for cause no longer has a job. And I'm sorry, we just don't have an interest in that. Or they even drop a department or a major altogether. Now, for someone like me who has lived and worked as an adjunct for 20 plus years, a moment like this with the erosion of tenure becoming more and more obvious, I have to tell you that this is a real I told you so moment. Yeah, I told you so. Trustees and administrators have been progressively implementing things like post-tenure review as a matter of course uh, for existing as well as new hires. That's something that adjuncts experience semester by semester. We get evaluated in most of our positions. They've also shifted from filling tenure track positions with other tenure track uh, candidates, and they've opted for hiring temporary visiting contract workers or a number of adjuncts to teach from semester to semester. Now, just a reminder, filling seven courses with adjunct costs a college or university about $20,000, $21,000 on average in the US. No benefits, no obligations, while hiring a tenure track professor means a commitment of $80,000 plus benefits for the foreseeable future, grant them tenure, and you're committing yourself to that with an ever incremental increase in their salary of 20 to 30 years of a financial commitment from an institution. Now, what do you think trustees and administrators want to do? Do they want to commit to $20,000 year after year, or they want to commit to 20 or 30 years of 80 plus thousand dollars in that ongoing commitment? Go ahead, take a guess. And if you're like any of my tenure track or tenured friends, your response to this shift in higher education is that that decreases the quality of education with rando professors coming and going and not as much of a buildup of a faculty reputation. And they're 100% right. It is detrimental in some respects to the quality of the school's reputation as a teaching or research institution. Absolutely right. But the question is, where were you when this was happening 10 and 20 years ago? Why didn't you see that and object to that and the shift away when you saw a colleague to retire, but their position filled by five, six, seven adjuncts or a temporary worker or an annual professor, a visiting professor with a one year contract? Where were you when this was happening 10 or 20 years ago? I know where you were. You were arguing for higher pay for yourself. Yes, that has always been the exchange. The number one pivot point for those in higher education is, let me ask for myself first, and then if I can help the lessers among us, I'll do that as well. You know it's true. So in today's colleges and universities, more than half of the teaching faculty that are listed as employees of the school are visiting temporary contract workers or adjuncts. And in some schools, up to 70% of the active coursework, especially those freshman seminars and required courses, are taught by adjuncts, temporary or seasonal workers. Yes, that is the colleges and universities that tenured peers work at have experienced this, not new today, not with the end of threatening their tenure, 
but for the last 10 or 20 years as the shift in higher education to temporary or adjuncts as the main source of in classroom instruction has taken place. And in exchange for that, instead of filling those academic positions with in-classroom uh, instructors, they have shifted to hiring more administrative positions, where the ratio has been two administrative hires for every single tenure track opening. Yep, two to one. And defenders of tenure today? Well, I have to say most of us have overplayed our hand. That is, we've asked for too much, we've assumed too much, we've thought of tenure as something that can never be taken away, and we've forgotten that post-tenure review and non-retention policies, dismissal for cause, have implicitly also been part of this permanent retention that people call tenure today. That is, we've always been able to be dismissed, whether it's a part-time faculty or a tenured faculty, if we do something that violates the tenets of the school's culture or policies, or there's a moral clause, yeah. You're supposed to be a good person. That is, most of us who claim the sky is falling and anybody touches our tenure, ooh, that's an awkward phrase, well, we're asking for too much, we're assuming too much, and we're not going to get what we're asking for. We are generating more heat than light. We don't know what the outcome will be, but we have not yet found a way to maintain the sanctity and the academic freedom that's protected by tenure in a way that actually guarantees something that we want as an outcome. That is, we want the academic freedom that has never been absolute, but has always been contingent on what the effectiveness of our role in higher education is. And instead of addressing the real problem that more and more students feel unprepared for the workforce with the degree and the programs that tenured faculty are involved in teaching, we've tended to ignore that and ask for maintaining a privilege which we may have lost. So where does this leave us today? Well, pretty much with the status quo, with an increasing erosion of tenure, with post-tenure review becoming more obvious, and with most ten tenured professors overplaying their hand and ignoring some of the real problems that exist in higher education. And in the meantime, leave your comments below about where you think tenure and post-tenure review is going and is tenure just gonna disappear? Leave those comments below because I need to hear from you. And thanks for being part of the Do Over Show. Please, while you're leaving a comment, could you tap the like button because it really helps. And while you're down there, how about you subscribe and ring the notification bell so you don't miss the next episode. I'm so glad you found me and I found you. Thanks.